Miss Jody here with another video for the matter and energy class that meets on Thursdays from 9:30 to noon. Um, so as a reminder, don't forget to be taking notes um, on little half sheets of paper so that I can glue them right there underneath the label in your journal so that we have our notes done. And my goal is if we are able to get back together at some point in May or um, June or whenever they'll let us, then hopefully we can do a few experiments to go along with this stuff that we've been learning because being separated is a little hard to do all these um, sound experiments and such that I've wanted to do. Hopefully you've gotten, not just sound, but all waves. Um, hopefully you've been able to do some of the stuff that I sent you through other videos on the Google Classroom, and that way you could keep things um, going and do some hands-on. Now, we are moving on to the behavior of sound, but just as a review, um, for a while we've been talking about waves. So, um, if you remember waves, there are certain characteristics to waves. Remember, it's wavelength, amplitude, frequency, and speed are the main four there. And so we talked about all waves have these characteristics, and so once you learn these characteristics, it can kind of help you figure out that particular type of wave, like we're working on with sound right now. And so we have this same, these same four characteristics that we saw in sound. Now here's my little diagram that I sent you in my colored version. Remember we did with the colors, and I said to drop some water on it, and then see it kind of move all over the place. A little psychedelic there. So hopefully yours turned out well. Save that for me. Um, but uh, with wave characteristics, there's also what we called wave behavior. So how waves behave. So there's also four main areas. And so if you learn the four main characteristics and the four main behaviors, then anytime you look at waves, you can see where these certain aspects fit at different waves between sound, light, whatever, water waves. So there is the process uh, we call reflection which is when it's gonna bounce back. And if you remember when something is being reflected, there's a law of reflection that states that the angle of this incident is gonna be equal to the angle of the refracted, um, reflected ray. And so there's this little um, math side of the angles that we can track in that law of reflection. So reflection is the change in the course of a wave as a result of a collision with an object or boundary. So sometimes waves will reflect and they'll bounce back. Sometimes they'll refract and refract is all about the bending. And so what happens is the bending of the path of the wave, it, it bends, at first it's just going straight, but when it moves into a boundary to a new media or a different temperature of something, um, so meaning if it goes from, from the air into water, it's gonna be different because air and water are different. And so the speed of it going through the air and the speed of going through water is gonna be different. Or even when it's going through different temperatures of water, when it's going through cold water versus warm water, um, you're gonna have a change. And we'll see that with sound today, how that works in the sound world. But the diagram, if you remember, was showing that there was going to be a bending once it gets into the new um, medium. And if you remember with waves, medium is the substance that the wave is traveling through. And so when you have a change, there's going to be a bending. And remember what that rule was? The, when it bends, which is the, what, what the ref, word refracted means, so the bend, the wave always bends towards the medium that slows it down. So whatever medium's slowing it down, that's which, what direction it's going to be bending. All right, and then there was also diffraction. Don't forget about that. That's when the spreading out of the wave happens as it passes through a small, narrow opening. So the, the opening has to be really narrow. And so when it's really, really narrow, it's going to then start, instead of going straight, it's going gonna, it's gonna to spread out and there's going to be a pattern there. Um, and it spreads out evenly when the open is roughly really small. It has to be equal to like one wavelength for it to spread out nice and evenly. All right, then there is interference. That's when the waves can interfere with each other. And sometimes they're good constructive interference where they can help each other, or it's destructive interference where they don't help each other. And if you remember, what happens is if the top, the crest to the crest meet, and they two waves are meeting each other and they're both crest to crest, then it can be constructive. But if it's crest to trowel, the bump all the way down and the bump up, then it's gonna be destructive. And so we'll see interference with our waves and we'll look at that today with sound. 
So with the waves, last uh, videos, we started being introduced to sound and seeing how sound, what sound is, is thought to be and how it behaves too. Well, not how it behaves, but its characteristics. And then today we'll look at how it behaves. All right, so sound, we, we, as you remember, it was the vibrations traveling through the medium and it was traveling in a longitudinal way. So it had the compressions, the squeezing together, and then the spreading out the rare fractions. So the high pressure and the low pressure. And remember there was an illustration in our book about this little guy here and these are the little air molecules and as the sounds moving through the air molecules, remember the air molecules, they don't get displaced. The medium doesn't get fully displaced. What happens is the energy just moves through it. And so the blue lines were the energy moving out. And this is like a big bubble of sound coming out from, from the little guy screaming or whatever. And so we talked also about how they, uh, scientists like Robert Boyle started working with sound and figuring out that sound had to have something to travel through. Not all um, waves will have to have something to travel through, but sound is definitely one that does have to have something to travel through. All right, so then we went on to wave characteristics. You remember that? And that's our four main things. Does, wave, does sound have wavelength? Amplitude, frequency, and speed, yes, because it's a wave. So it's gonna have those four characteristics. And we talked about what the wavelength would be like, what amplitude would be linked to. And remember, that's linked to the, the idea of intensity, sort of that, the loudness of the sound. And then frequency was related to pitch, and that's kind of the frequency of the sound is what we would refer to as the pitch. And then also the speed of the sound. And remember, in both of these frequencies and speed, there was that, in that frequency, there was the infra sonic and then there was the ultrasonic and these two were above the normal hearing range that we would normally um, be able to determine with our own ears so there is sound that goes below our ability to hear it and above our ability to hear it and so we have to remember it's not just what we're hearing there's other sounds out there that we can't hear and then when it came to the speed of sound we also talked about that and that the speed of sound again it's going to vary because it's depending on what it's going through in that process of refraction that bending but we had the regular what we would say the regular speed of sound um, and there's like a standard here that we would put at a, at a um, zero degrees Celsius um, say for um, dry air and then there is if you go above that speed of sound then you would be supersonic or if you go below it, you'd be subsonic. So you remember that. So that was the characteristics of sound. Remember I told you to, to um, do this little um, picture here and illustrate that a little bit, color those a little nice, then that helps us understand that there is some risk to sound and we, we have to be careful because sound, it, um, too much of it uh, would, would cause some problems. And so we have to watch um, the, the um, intensity of the sound. And so then we have today, we have the sound behavior. So sound behavior is gonna go right back to wave behavior. So if you look, let me just show you. See how on wave behavior I got reflection, refraction, diffraction, interference. Then you look at sound, reflection, refraction, diffraction, interference. Because they are waves, so they are behaving in this way. So as long as you kind of memorize those four behaviors and understand what they mean, then you can apply them to any wave. Um, so with sound, does it reflect? Yes, sound, it does reflect and it obeys the law of reflection. That is that law that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of, ref of reflection. So that's that whole little diagram that we did where it's coming in and it hits and then it reflects out. And so I'll do this going in. It hits here. This is the boundary and then it reflects out. And then if you split these two angles, or split this right in half, this is the angle of incident and this is the angle of reflection and they are equal to each other. So it's going to obey that law of reflection. So just like we saw with regular characteristics of waves. Now sound reflection occurs all the time. Now this is important for us to know because it's all around us. In every room you have sound bouncing off of things and coming back and you think to yourself but if it's doing that why don't I just constantly hear all these crazy sounds flying back at me and it just sound like a bunch of ball of craziness right? Well that's because you can barely notice it because of the distance between you and the, the, the um, surface it's bouncing off, like the walls or whatever. Because if it's less than
then when the sound is is returning if it's and going and bouncing off and then returning back if it's less than 0 0.1 seconds apart okay so i i say a sound it goes it goes flying it hits the wall and then it comes back to me if it's less than this amount apart meaning the first sound is not 0 0.1 seconds apart from the second sound coming back to my ears then my ears are just going to hear it as one sound because it wasn't enough um, uh, time for my ear to calculate two sounds there. So my ear just calculates one. That's all my ear thinks it heard. It went down, it bounced off the wall and came back. My ear thought it heard just one sound that's in the room. So because what happens is because the way that sound travels and its speed, so it's going to be traveling um, pretty not too far in a room, right? So in order for it to actually, tr um, in order for your ear to hear two sounds, it would have to travel very, very far and bounce off something and then come back so that it's it takes long enough time that your ear would actually hear two sounds. So you'd actually have to be like a hundred and at least 110, over 110 feet away. So the surface that it's gonna bounce off, okay? So in my room, my surface is right next to me. So it's not even, you know, six feet. <laughs> That's not far enough. So I would need, so if, if it is going to be able to be heard, it's gotta be above 56 feet away from me, right? Because 56 feet will take, the sound will travel the 56 feet, hit the, hit whatever, the canyon or whatever, and then come back and hit my ear. If it's above 56 feet, then I would hear it as an echo. And so that's because of how fast it's, it's moving. So if it's more, um, if it's less than 0 0.1 seconds apart because it's too fast, the wall's too close to me, I won't hear it. But if it's more than 0 0.1 seconds apart with, say, I'm in a canyon and I make my sound and it goes way, 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 way far and then it hits the wall of the canyon and then it comes way back to me. If it's more than 56 feet away, let's say it's, you know, two... Um, 200 feet away, then when that sound gets back to me, because it's traveling and it's traveling at a certain speed, by the time it gets back to me, I hear it as a second sound, not my first sound. And so that creates what we call the echo world. So you know, you've been in times when you, um, and, and you'll see the little diagram that I sent you has the same sort of four areas that we're working on with wave behavior. And so with this diagram, I'm representing here at the top, the first one, the reflection. So see how I have the little yellow um, sound? So this is me screaming out or whatever, or somebody screaming out. And so we're screaming out, it hits the wall. And then when it hits the wall, it's gotta reflect back. And as it's coming back to me, then I will hear it all as one sound if it's really, really close together. But say I could separate, because it's too fast. It comes right back too fast. It's, it's under the amount of time that I would hear a different sound. But let's say I stretch this out to a big giant canyon, and then it goes all the way down, and, and then all the way back to me. By the time that all the way back to me gets there, it's a little bit later, and so my ear has the chance to hear the second sound. It's not so like click right at the same time. And so then I can create all these cool um, echoes in big spaced out areas, right? And so they say like canyons, big gymnasiums or whatever. They said in our book that there was a place in Woodstock, England that um, is really famous for its echoes. And it says that you can say, ha, and it will re it'll echo back sometimes up to 17 times. And it will sound like this, ha, 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 ha. Like you're laughing and you're saying, ha, 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 ha. So I think that's pretty cool, right? And I'm sure you've had opportunities to do echoes in certain caves or canyons and hiking and stuff like that. Now with the sound of um, or the situation with reflection, you also can use this in the um, technology of sonar. And so sonar stands for um, S, it's sonar, S-O-N-A-R. It stands for sound, navigation, and ranging. So sound, navigation, and ranging. And so sonar is what uh, ships use, um, submarines use it. There's a lot of uses for the sonar. And all it's basically doing is this same situation. So it's going to be sending off the sound down through the water. And then the water 
If there's something underneath it, like a submarine that it's looking for or whatnot, or if it's mapping the bottom of the ocean, and then it will bounce it back up. And because we can determine the speed of the sound through the water, through the media, then we can determine how far away something is. And this is what they're actually using for mapping the bottom of the ocean um, that they're doing right now, the project that's done by NOAA, the um, National... Um, aquatic maybe, I forget what NOAA stands for, um, something, something, but I'm sending you a video on it and it's showing how they are using that sonar to map the oceans. So that's super cool. Okay. So that is the behavior of reflection. Now with reflection, we also have a refraction. And remember, that's when it gets bent. So this is when it reflects back. This is when it gets bent. And so we have to remember that the speed is not constant. The wave speed of sound or whatever is not constant and because it varies depending on which media, which means whatever substance is going through, and then also which temperature um, of the substance because the temper temperature can change it. And so remember the rule when we talked about wave behavior? It always bends towards the medium that slows it down. So whoever's gonna slow it down is gonna make it bend towards it. And so I have a similar diagram like we did when we were doing wave behavior, but this representing sound, the behavior of sound. And I can do the same thing here. Um, let me get a, a little orange. Let me see if I can find a, an orange crayon here. Oh, that's kind of purplish, but that'll work. All right, so if I look at the diagram, the top of this first one, it says hot air, the faster sound speed. So I'm saying, okay, so say in my air, I have some really warm air up here at the top. So I'm making it red, pinkish, because I can't find a red. But so I'm making that warmer air, right? And in the bottom, I have colder air, which I'm making blue. So colder air is represented with the blue. So what happens is the sound tries to travel through, but there's a little change in the traveling, and that makes sense, because as it's trying to travel through, it's going through different um, substances. So when it first starts out, let's say, it's down here, and that's my sound source, and it's going through the cold air, and then, um, which makes it slower. Now the reason it's slower is the air molecules are kind of squeezed together, remember? The sound has to vibrate from one molecule to the next molecule to the next molecule, and so they're kind of more dense. And so it begins to, but then the moment the sound gets up here, when it's, um, warmer, then it can kind of move faster. So it tries to move faster, and what it does in this top part up here is sort of creates this, this little arc down towards the slower medium. So that's that rule is that it always bends towards the medium that slows it down. So you see that there? It's gonna be bending that way because it's gonna slow it down. And then we have the same picture here of opposite. If we end up having the um, cold air at the top, like say you have a system of where cold air is up at the top and the warm air is more down towards the ground, then get my warm air down here or hot air or whatever. And um, so the hotter air, we know it's going to travel faster because those air molecules spread out. So they have a, they can kind of vibrate and then hit each other. And then um, the vibrations can continue to pass, but they're kind of spread out a little bit more. So if the sound source is here and it's trying to move really, really fast, but then it starts hitting some of this um, as it's coming out, it starts hitting some of this cooler air. It's going to bend towards the one that slows it down. And the cool air slows it down. So it has to start bending towards that. And so that's that area of refraction, the bending of the waves through different substances. And so then we also have the diffraction. Remember what diffraction is? And so diffraction is when the sound waves are traveling through some type of small hole. And it's got to be very small, and especially if it's, if it's the size of like one wavelength wide. So you see I put the little wavelength so you can remember the wavelength. So if it's only like one wavelength wide and it goes to a small hole like that, then it doesn't continue straight. Instead, it's gonna spread out. And what's important about this is, is this allows sound to be heard um, 
and go around things like behind sound to be heard on the other side of the door like if you're listening really close and you're spying on your brother or sister not that I say that's a good idea but say you are um, and you're listening you have your ear by the door the reason you can hear any sound is that it can because sound can be diffracted it can bend around or um, it can move through small holes and still continue on and so here is the idea of the diffraction and so if I have my sound here my sound source and then it begins to move out and we have to remember that these lines are lines of squeezes and then um, spreading out and squeezes and spreading out and squeezes and spreading out and so as they're going through in this longitudinal way as it starts there's that little hole and so the sound will come through the vibration will come through and it will start its new pattern and it will squeeze through and then it will start spreading out in its new pattern. And so the receiver is gonna hear it a little bit differently, right? Because it's coming out in a different, um, it's not in that same pattern of the original uh, source. And so one thing to note is low frequency sounds. So low frequency means it's not frequently hitting you. So they're the longer wavelength sounds. So it's just lower amount of times hitting you how frequent is it hitting you remember that so low frequency sounds um, are good at, around large objects they diffract diffract better and so they can get around so like a regular normal sound like a regular voice which is a low frequency sound can get around objects so like they say if you're trying to to um, just talk to somebody and it's gonna go around a door or it's gonna go around, you know, if you're outside, they said something like, if you're behind a tree or something, somebody's trying to talk to you, um, a low frequency will go around, but if you have really high frequency, really high, um, and they, they represent that with whispers, it's harder for those higher frequencies to get around those large objects. And so that's a, a, a concept that fits with diffraction. And then we have interference. Remember what interference is, is when the wave Waves come together and collide. Now when sound waves collide, they travel through each other without causing permanent distortion. So they don't like distort it in a sense of like how you would think it would like in the refraction side of things. It's not that it gives permanent distortion. But what happens is that there's times when these waves can come together and they will create with this interference a destructive interference where it will cause problems when a compression and a rare fraction of two different waves hit each other. And then um, if it's a compression or a compression hit each other from two different waves, that can actually be a constructive um, interference. So what happens is if you have the wrong two come together and that destructive, if, if it has the same magnitude, it can actually even cancel out the sound entirely if they're exactly the same um, magnitude. But um, it, it's going to cause some problems. You're going to have some destruction, uh, destructive interference. But when it comes to compression to compression, constructive or rare fraction to rare fraction, when they come together, and because they are the same kind, they can actually help each other and constructively increase their wave um, and it amplifies it. It makes it kind of stronger in a sense. And so we can have both sides to the um, interference world of sound so if you remember and let me try to use two different colors so i don't use the the yellow and the the blue okay so if i i mean the yellow and the orange if i look at this this is supposed to be two speakers okay so i have two speakers let's say at a concert or something like that or a church and your acoustics they have it all set up a certain way so that you have sounds that are um, real well done Okay, so I'm gonna do my little dot, dot, dot one. See how it's coming out, dot, dot, dot. That's the rare fraction. That's the spreading out, right, of the longitudinal way, and wave. And then comes the squeeze together. I'm gonna do that in green, the compression. And then what do I have? I have a then spreading out. And then I've got squeeze together. And then I got spreading out. And these are the waves of the first speaker, spreading out going at the same time and then squeeze together. Then on my other speaker, I have a similar pattern, I, obviously, because they're both longitudinal ways. So I have my um, uh, spreading out, squeeze together, and spreading out, and then squeeze together. 
spread out. And you can just do this with that whatever color and your you have on you, but just separating by two different colors because what it's gonna do is help us see where it's constructive and where it's destructive. Now, constructive means that both of the types, uh, parts of the wave, they are the same if it's constructive. So if I look and I say, okay, the, um, the squeezing together of this wave is touching the squeezing together of this wave right here. So that will be constructive. So that can create constructive interference that can amplify the wave. Um, that's also meeting right here, you see it? So that's constructive. It's also meeting right here, and then it's meeting right here. And so whenever the meeting um, that of the compressions, then you have a, const you have a um, constructive. But then you can also see there's the meeting of the rare fractions. So here's a meeting of the rare fractions. That would be constructive, right? And so no matter whether it's um, rare fraction or compression, when you have the meeting of the same kind, that's when you would have the constructive. Now, if you have the two meeting of of two different kinds, like the green meeting with the yellow, like here, that's not gonna be good, right? That's gonna be destructive. So this would be our destructive side where a yellow and green would meet or whatever, okay? And so the interference of the, the sound can be understood between the destructive side or the constructive side. And see what happens is sound um, scientists that figure these things out and then also sound um, engineers who then take the understanding of the science and they build stuff around it, they know how to use this science to create good sound for, like I said, churches and um uh, concerts and all sorts of things and so the very science that we understand and know can be used in such an applicable way just like we see with the reflection you know how reflection works so then you create a sonar right and so it's pretty cool all these things that we see similar among the different wave um, behaviors and specifically how they work with the behavior of sound now our next video is also part of this lesson and it's going to be um, on music and so we're just going to talk a little bit about the music and then we'll be done with this unit.